IB Nation, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. feel like I haven't seen you guys in a while, but I am glad to be back. Ready to talk some Notre Dame football. Today I'm going to do a show talking about what I saw at practice today. We only got to see about four periods before they started to kick us out, so it's a little bit limited on what we were able to see. I did focus mostly on the offense today. And then afterwards, I'm going to talk about how the depth this spring is certainly being tested for this football team. And as we get closer and closer to the blue gold game, I'm going to talk about some playmakers that I'm seeing emerge for Notre Dame. Not so much projecting into the fall who the playmakers will be, but some guys that have shown themselves to be playmakers through the spring. And this is partly on what we've seen, but also partly on some things that I've heard and some things that I've been told. So it's a very exciting time, obviously, to be following Notre Dame football right now. And then at the end, um, or at the yeah, at the end, I'll just we'll, we'll talk about that part at the end about the playmakers. But it's offense and defense, and so we're going to have a lot to, to talk about on that. Going to have an intel piece coming up here on the board soon, uh, kind of just some things that I've heard through the spring. Going to have a little bit maybe tonight, and then a bigger one post-spring, so you'll definitely want to check that out for sure. Lots of fun stuff going on. And, of course, a lot more breakdowns. The Mike Denbrock offense coming up. Going to talk some of his play action stuff, some RPO stuff, and uh, get into some of his other top pass concepts. We'll dive into some more breakdown individual runs, you know, so an inside zone video and an outside zone video as we get into the summer. So lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff going on here at Irish Breakdown, which means it's a great time to sign up for the message boards at boards at irishbreakdown.com. And, uh, you know, to, to get all of that good stuff. So tons have been tons of recruiting updates lately. So it is certainly a great time, great time to be alive and a great time to be part of the IB community, IB team. So definitely check that out, boards at irishbreakdown.com. Hit that like button before we get started. I'm going to knock that sucker out of the park now, get that done now, and we'll be ready to rock and roll. So I'm going to begin today's show talking about a little bit about practice and what we got a chance to see. As I said, Notre Dame held another practice today inside the Labar practice facilities. So it was really nice. It was a beautiful day in South Bend. I think it was 65, 70 degrees this morning. It was like I think it might have been around 65 around practice time. By 10 o'clock, I'm taking – Angela, the doctor at 10 a.m. And it was already up to 70, just an absolutely gorgeous day. And so I was glad to see them outside, which was really cool. So we got a chance to be outside and, and enjoy the nice, beautiful, beautiful weather at South Bend. And Notre Dame went through their typical, you know, typical start of practice. There was a little bit, there were some things that we got a chance to see a little bit of today, which was nice. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But we, we start, they started to kick us out at the beginning of prep period five. So we, or, I mean, uh, yeah, period five. So we really only got to see four practice, four, four periods. And because there's so little time there, I, today I decided to focus on one side of the ball and, and also the defense tends to do a lot of drill work, which is great. I mean, it's good from a coaching standpoint, it's really good, but from a practice report and practice observation standpoint, it, it doesn't do a ton. Because, hey, guess what? You know, the, the DBs and linebackers that are on scholarship at Notre Dame look athletic. That, that That's the epitome of it. And there's some nerdy stuff that we could get into that you like. You you know, really like the things being taught at linebacker about, you know, foot placement and and how they're being taught to communicate, all that kind of stuff. But that's not really the stuff that uh, is between that and what they do on offense. There's just more to gather by what we what they're doing on offense for us. So, again, not a criticism of the defense at all if I'm a football coach and I'm just there for coaching purposes I love what they're doing on defense but for the purposes of a practice report the offense is a little bit was a little bit better with what they were doing today so I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, still you know what we saw there's no one-on-ones today there was no team on team so there's not a lot of that we are supposed to get access to the practice on Saturday which is going to be a, a full practice so hopefully they'll let us see some stuff then That'll be nice to see some team stuff, but just some things that we gathered that I was able to gather today in the four periods that we were out there. Start with quarterback, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the receivers and the offensive line. I'll go through some of the team takeoff stuff that we saw them do today because there's some interesting stuff in there as well. And uh, finish with a little talk about the offensive line. So to begin, I'm going to talk about the period where we saw the Notre Dame offense go out there today and go through sort of a team takeoff, which they used to do in the past, if you guys remember. Uh, they did this a lot in the past. They haven't done it as much the last couple of years, but they basically just line up three sets of offensive team. It's first team, second team, third team, and they kind of go. 
And in the past, they'd kind of start at midfield or, you know, a little bit further back and, and go. Today, they started at like, like, like the 20-yard line, it looked like. They are way backed up, got a lot more plays in. It's just about precision and kind of getting into the flow and just getting the ball out. And so we saw that. So the first team group, obviously, Riley Leonard was out of practice today, did some throwing work, but he's not doing any teamwork right now. So he wasn't part of this period. He was – it was kind of cool. He was in the back of the line and he was going through his footwork, just kind of simulating a snap and, and doing those type of things and, and going through that as they as the quarterbacks are going through it. So the first group came out. It was Steve Angeli at quarterback, Jadarian Price at running back. The receivers were Micah Gilbert in the boundary. It was Chris Mitchell as the field outside guy, Jaden Greathouse as the slot, and Cooper Flanagan at tight end. So they were an 11 personnel. The offensive line left to right was Charles Jagasaw, Pat Coogan, Ashton Craig, Billy Shrouth, and Tosh Baker. That was with the first team. And uh, they were sharp. I mean, they were pretty crisp. Started off with some screen stuff, did a couple inside runs, got the ball thrown down the field a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't see a ball hit the ground. Maybe one did because it was kind of at times you're watching three groups run a rep at once which can be hard, but I didn't see a ball hit the ground. That's that's a, a thing you want as a coach. You want to make sure that you're crisp and there, there's no defense, right? Your ball should hit the ground. And they were crisp. They were coming off fast. There was a good tempo, good pacing. Um, I, I liked what I saw from them in that period, just from what you're trying to accomplish. What you're trying to accomplish, like, hey, let's get that blood flowing a little bit. You know, we've gone through some individual stuff. Let's get that blood flowing. Let's get everybody on the same page. Let's get some communication. Let's come off the line quick and let's get the ball out where it's supposed to go. And, and so we saw a, a pretty sharp group today. The second group was Kenny Minchie at quarterback, Jeremiah Love at running back. At receiver, you had Deion Colsey in the boundary. You had Cam Williams to the field and K.K. Smith in the slot. And then the third group, you had uh, – or the offensive line left to right. You had Eli Raritan at tight end. And uh, offensive line left to right was Sullivan Absher, left tackle, and then Rocco Spindler, left guard. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You had Sam Pendleton at center. You had Christopher Tarek at right guard, and then you had Emil Wagner at right tackle. The third group was C.J. Carr at quarterback, Aeneas Williams at running back. The receivers were Alex Whitman was the left the, the outside receiver, and I saw Jack Pullion in the slot. I could not see who the other outside receiver was. It was a walk-on, I believe, but I couldn't see who it was. So I, I don't know who that was. And then the tight ends, they, they rotated between a couple guys. I think Charlie Selden got some reps, I think. Uh, Henry Garrity got some reps. They rotated through a few guys there at the uh, at the third tight end position. And I mentioned Aeneas Williams was the running back with C.J. Carr. Offensive line left to right was Styles Prescott at left tackle. Then you had Ty Chan at left guard. You had Joe Odding at center. You had – actually, you know what? I wrote that I, – I said that correctly incorrectly. The left guard on the third group was Peter Jones. Joe Odding was a center, and then Ty Chan was at right guard. And then Anthony Knapp was a right tackle. So it, it is fitting when we talk about some of these positions where you're going to see some positions where the third team is fully walk-ons. And with others, the third team is guys. You're like, that guy's a pretty good player. And uh, it, and we'll talk a little bit about that during segment two, where I talk about how this team's depth is being tested. And so, yeah, that was kind of gave us a sense of where guys are lining up now. It's not an end-all, be-all. If just because this one guy's the first team doesn't mean he's a starter now or Wherever the case may be, you don't necessarily rotate a lot during this period, at least at receiver, running back. You're just going to kind of go through the period and and guys are going to get to work. And, you know, everything was kind of what we expected with the exception of the boundary with Micah Gilbert. And as we kind of get into the practice, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I saw from Micah Gilbert today and what we've continued to see and hear about Micah Gilbert. I want to begin with quarterback. Briefly, you know, we got out there. The quarterbacks are doing their typical warm-up drills. You know, they're throwing straight on, throwing diagonal to the left, throwing diagonal to the right, working on their just their drops, kind of getting to the rhythm, loosening their arms up. They, you know, looked good. I, I thought today CJ and Steve Angeli were just were a little bit high with some of their throws. It's part of the warm-up process. You know, it's going to happen from time to time. But overall, the velocity was good. The ball placement was good. When guys were missing, they were missing like here, missing here. It wasn't nothing, nothing crazy. Got two routes on air, and I thought overall, I thought the quarterbacks were really sharp today. There was a couple times, and this is something that I thought was very encouraging from what I could see. There was a couple times where I actually thought the the quarterbacks had thrown long, so they were working on different routes. I don't want to get in too specifics because I don't know how they'll feel about that. 
but they were working on there's always some kind of you know quick outside route there's always some kind of deeper route either corner post there's some kind of over the middle route and then they'll have something kind of uh you know sort of a check down type of route and there was there was a corner route was one of the routes being given and that's like again i don't want to get too much in the specifics and, and be giving the plays away because they were actually running plays you know, mike denbrock was calling them they were hey this is the formation they were in what i call trio three receivers on one side tied into another you had four quarterbacks going and then they were running you know they were doing the route combinations and so uh, uh twice on a corner route once by once by steve angeli and i think once the other one was by cj carr I actually thought the ball was long. I was like, oh, that's too far. And the receivers were able to run underneath it. That's two, that means two things. That isn't like bad ball, but glad you have fast receivers. It, it wasn't that. So I don't want it to come across as that. It was more so like, you know, look, the, the, these quarterbacks are really getting on a, a good page with these receivers because the ball's coming out. Like I'm thinking it's a little bit long and the receivers are running underneath it like in stride. It tells me that that they're getting on the same page. These quarterbacks know where to get the ball to. The receivers need know exactly where they need to get to to get the ball. Because if I throw the ball out to in the you know, and, and I think it's going to be long. If I if that receiver has to kind of go off course at all, he's not going to get to that football. But today they were going through and just dropping them on dimes. Now there's a couple times that I thought the ball came out late. I think there was a ball from Angeli. That I think I think it was Rangeli that that Deion Colsey, Colsey caught on the sideline, but then caught it, step, and then he's out of bounds. I'd rather see them you know, catch the ball in bounds with a chance to get upfield. But when they missed, it was missing that way. It was just like it just the ball didn't come out quite on time, and and it didn't get where it needed to get to. But I thought they were sharp overall. The balls over the middle were coming out high, you know, getting over the line if there was one. Sometimes you can get into bad habits when you're doing RVA especially when there's no offensive line where on some of the shorter throws, you just kind of get down and, you know, snap it off and it's low. That ball's not going to work if you've got six, five, six, six guys in front of you and defensive linemen putting their hands up. So it's good to see them not getting into those bad habits and the offensive, the quarterbacks really coming, you know, just with their nice over the top deliveries, get that ball over the top, get to the receivers and, and getting it all accurately out there. So that was a positive to see. But just the big takeaway wasn't, hey, guess what? Notre Dame scholarship athletes look good, right? I mean, that that wasn't so much the takeaway just in generally, but you you ha you can't ignore the speed that you see from this group, even with some guys out. Jaden Harrison wasn't practicing today. Jaden Thomas continues to be very limited in what he does. He went through stretch, a little bit of drill work, and that's about it. We didn't see many of the team peers and see him in the RVA. So it would I would assume that he's nursing something. I don't know what it is. But I would assume he's worth nursing something, and and so you know getting a little bit low on numbers. But just what you know, we saw Chris Mitchell today really turn loose. And, but the, the the big thing is is the quarterbacks and the receivers are really starting to to be sharp and really starting to be on the same page. And this has now been a couple practices in a row that we've seen that. And and honestly, it's been kind of it's been kind of good all spring which to me said a lot more about the quarterbacks than necessarily the receivers because the quarterbacks are all really talented and, and have ability. But now you're starting to see there's this really good feel both ways. The receivers know where to get to. The quarterbacks know where the receivers are going to be, and they're getting the ball where they need to get the ball to. A uh, couple observations. I thought Steve was pretty, pr pretty sharp today. He had a solid day throwing the football. Riley had a good day throwing the football. Uh, Kenny was probably the least consistent of all the quarterbacks, but when I say consistent, it's more so he was completing passes. They were completing passes. Again, I, I didn't see a lot of balls hit the ground today. And, and and off the top of my head, I can only think of one that I saw hit the ground today, which there was a lot of balls being thrown during that period of time. So when I talk about least consistent, it's like of four quarterbacks that were pretty good, he was probably least consistent – and it was more so just from a ball placement. His ball placement wasn't quite as sharp today from what I saw as it is normally, but still had a solid day. The guy that that has really stood out to me uh, last couple of practices, but this one especially was CJ Carr. And, and what you see from CJ is he's starting to carry himself a little bit different. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, CJ has always been a kid that's that's confident and he's he believes in himself. He's not cocky and arrogant. He's just he's confident. He knows he can throw the football pretty good. But in December and even in the early spring practices, he was still a freshman trying to trying to learn. And what you're seeing 
the last couple days is, and and this is something that every coach looks for. You look for it from your quarterback. You look for them from your receivers, your running backs, whatever position I've coached. You you look for that when kids first get to camp and and when younger players are being thrust into situations maybe they hadn't in the past. Is when does a kid start to carry himself differently? And what I mean by that is this. It, it, and I use this analogy a lot. But when you're walking around somewhere, if you're walking around, you know, you get up out of your own bed at night and you're going to go down to the kitchen, even if the lights are off, you 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 know what you're doing. Right. But go to a friend's house that you've never been in before and you're crashing there and you get them in the night. You're you're feeling around. You're unsure of yourself. You're trying to find a light switch or is this the step? There's some uncertainty there. Right. And and I've used a car, you know, cars as an example. But I thought when talking about CJ Carr, it might be too lame to use that as an example. But you can just see a guy that's feeling his way. And when a guy just like, OK, here's what we're doing. I know what we're doing. I'm out here. I'm sharp. I'm, I'm confident. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it out. I know exactly where to be. I know what drill's coming next. I know what the coach wants from me. I know what my receivers are doing. I know what I know all this stuff. And and you're no longer in that sort of, OK, wait a minute. What comes after period one? What comes after uh, warm up? What comes after stretch? What comes after this? You know, wait a minute. Wait, wait, what am I doing with this route again? How do you say that? verb? Because there, there's one play and I won't say what it was, but it was funny. Mike Denbrock's uh given the play and i'm just like okay he's gonna end it there no he's gonna end it there gonna... so like there's some verbiage to this thing right there it's not just you know twins right smash you know it's it's not that it's it's got some verbiage to it and you can just hear you know you you can just see it processing and you can see a kid who's not sure what he's doing he's a receiver for example get that call and he'll look around and kind of like you know like look at the quarterback like you know hey do i got this you know and then the, the guys that got it locked down, they get the call, and then boom, they're off to their spot. They're lined up. They're looking at the defense, and they're, they're not even thinking about the play. It just – I heard the word, I processed it, and boom, I'm ready to go. Young players, that you can see the wheels turning with younger players, right? And quarterbacks are the same way. Like, C.J. Carr is confident when it's like, hey, C.J., throw a post. All right, cool, I'm going to drop back. Slang it, throw a post. Same with Kenny Minchie, but when it's like, C.J., I'm going to give you this long call – and you've got to know it. You've got to get everybody lined up. You've got to make sure what everybody's doing. Then there's some more of like, wait a minute, hold on. Is, is his splits proper? Is he where he's supposed to be? Well, what's the what's is that guy inside or outside? Like there's just a lot of thought process. Well, what you're starting to see from CJ is less of that churning and more of just the I got the call and go because it's clicking now. And, and it's like anything, you know, you, you think of in your work, like you think of your first day at work. When your boss is teaching you, okay, this is what we're figuring out and this is what we're doing. And you're just like, okay, hold on a second. Then you got to think of the processes. And then you get to the point like you've been doing this for a couple months. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, you just get there. It's almost like it's, it's routine. And so what we're seeing with CJ, and, you know, Kenny's starting to get it as well. And what we're seeing with CJ is it's just, it's going in and it's going in and it's just like, okay, boom, it's there. I got it. I know where I'm going. And that was this was the first time I've really I have seen. Now I'm not saying CJ hasn't done this in past practices. We just haven't seen a whole lot. And and so we saw the first full practice. We saw the only full practice we saw was practice one. And we've seen, you know, what four or five like little five period deals where they're going through individuals. We haven't seen a ton. So this may have been happening before, but this is the first time that I saw it where CJ was out there and it just was he he just he doesn't he didn't look like what you what you see from a freshman or a newer guy early on where it's a thought and then you can see the thought you can almost like see it churning in their head and then they go CJ today was just like all right coach we go okay boom, 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 boom. Right, let's go and and that was good to see you know from the younger guy from the freshman to see that and so it was noticeable today and and the more comfortable CJ gets with that stuff the more accurate he was the quicker the ball was coming out, you know, and he's just, he's just putting the ball. I mean, just, you know, just painting a picture today with how he was throwing the football. So that was good to see, but the mental comes first. The mental has to come first because in, in, in what they're doing today, like here's like, here's an example. And, and you'll see this. And, and we saw it, I think once today. So it's, they're still not out of the woods yet, but they'll do a, a drill. It's not even a drill, but they'll line up and you'll have four quarterbacks lined up under like in the shotgun formation. Thank you. And then you have four different receivers running a route. And so let's just say today they have a quick outcut. This isn't what we saw today, but I'm just say an example, quick outcut by one guy and then a corner route by another guy. And then a, uh, an over route by another guy. And then a deep post by another guy backside out, whatever. That's not what we saw today. I'm using just a random concept that everybody in the world does. I just basically, 
describe smash with a backside high low. That's what I just described. And so one quarterback will throw the smash route. The other quarterback will throw the corner. One guy will throw the over. The other guy will throw the backside out cut or the backside post, whatever the case may be. And every single time you see this early in fall camp or spring practice or something like that, they'll drop back and some quarterback won't throw it. Like he won't throw it. He's like, hold on a second. Uh, which way, um, who, who am I getting again? Or you'll see him throw it late because he'll wait for all the other balls to go. And they're like, okay, nobody threw to the corner. So I got the corner. Or if it's, you know, he knows, well, this guy's got the corner. One of us has the corner. One of us has the flag, you know, or the, the smash, but, but which one is mine? So he'll wait, let that other guy, okay, that guy threw the smash. So now I know I got to throw the corner. And, and so you're going to see things like that. And it's some uncertainty or the, the my favorite is when you see two guys throw the ball to the same guy. <clears throat> you guys remember last year in fall camp when Jadarian Price had that play where he caught one ball and then another quarterback threw it to him and he went up and caught it with a second hand? That wasn't on purpose. That was one quarterback threw it to him and was supposed to. The other quarterback threw it to him and wasn't supposed to, but Jadarian saw it and reached up and grabbed it. So what I liked about what we saw today and, and we saw from the last practice is when they get to this period, there's a lot more certainty. I think there was once today that I saw that they weren't, one of the guys wasn't sure where you're supposed to go with the ball. But when you got out there today, it was drop. They're throwing in rhythm. You know, there, there's kind of a, a, a symphony-ish aspect to it because they're not all throwing the ball at the same time. Because if I'm throwing to the quick route, I know that, okay, I got to I got to set on my feet because if I'm throwing that route, it's because the read has sped things up and I got to boom, you know, hit plant drive and get the ball out. If I'm throwing the corner route, it's because my initial read wasn't there. So I got to continue my depth. I got to then get my gather and I got to get the ball out. And then, you know, and then if you're throwing backside, it's I'm looking front side, then I'm coming back to the backside. So those are all aspects of, of, of kind of what you're trying to, what you're trying to see. And so the ball doesn't come out at the same time all the time, but you can see the rhythm with each guy. And today we saw a lot more of that. And, and we saw some of it in the last practice we saw as well, which tells me, again, the quarterbacks are starting to get more and more and more comfortable with what they're doing, especially the younger players. And because when those issues happen, it tends to be, you know, Kenny and CJ and then Riley a little bit that first those first couple of days. Steve has been this now year three. Steve kind of knows where to go with the football. So those are all things that I saw from the quarterback position today that I was very encouraged by, especially, like I said, with CJ. And, uh, you know, just that comfort level with him is very, very important. Let's talk a little bit about the wide receivers that we saw today. And not a ton. You know, some guys weren't out there. I didn't see, you know, I said Jaden Harrison wasn't out there. You saw uh, Jaden Thomas wasn't out there. Uh, Jordan Faison's not out there. You don't have, you know, um, uh, uh, Bo Collins is out there, but he can't practice, right? So he's out there, in, you know, shorts and t-shirt, just listening and learning. He can't, he can't participate in practice. And so you're a little thin on numbers today, but what that allowed us to do is kind of, you know, get a few more reps of the guys that were out there. And, and I, and the first thing ever, it's been this way, every practice, I, I, I can honestly say, I can't think of a practice outside of maybe the first one where I thought Chris Mitchell was really good, that anyone other than Jaden Greathouse has not been the most impressive guy. I mean, it's just – and it's usually – it's not that it's not close. It's just – it's very obvious is the way to put it. I mean, it's – other guys are performing well, but it's just it's just obvious that Jaden is kind of that guy right now at receiver. He's the first guy in every drill, and that was true today. And when they do a drill, he's the first guy taking the rep. He is – just goes through everything, even something like this. So obviously it's receiver drills. It could be a thing as simple as like the slots, you know, go first or something like that. I mean, slot, then Z, the next. It could be something as simple like that. But even today, like when they were doing this drill with the defense where the quarterback, the defense, the, the receiver has his back to the defender. It's a one-on-one -on -one drill. The receiver has his back to the defender and he catches the ball. And then he gets hit with a patty, spins off, and squares at the defense. The defense has to do a quick up down, and then they go in space. Well, what I liked about the drill today is they had a lot more room for the offensive players to work with. And that's a very pro offensive player, period. But the reason I like it is because, number one, it forces the offensive players to be somewhat assertive. Like, look, you pick a lane and attack it or make your move. 
But for the defense, it makes them have to work a much bigger ground, meaning they're stressed more. And so even though that, I mean, the offense is usually going to win that period and they should. And if they don't, you have problems. But I like that because you're putting even more of a burden on the defense, which makes it they're, they're going to learn better and get better at it. But the thing that you saw today was just how effective this roster is compared to past years of having guys that can make people miss and guys that have a little bit of speed that put the defense in a bind. And we saw that from Jaden today as well. He he show, He's showing really good a burst. We've talked about this all spring, showing a really good burst. He's getting off the line effectively. He's very sudden with his movements. Like I remember seeing that as a, as a punt returner in high school where he can make people miss, but it was – he knew how to set guys up. He's a smart, savvy player. But what we're seeing today and what we've really seen all spring – is he's so sharp with his cuts. I mean, it's just, it's very sudden and he's just in and out of his breaks really, really fast, either as a, as a route runner and like a drill like today. And so it's just impressive. And then the other thing is he carries himself with a lot of confidence. And I'll dive more into that when I get into the playmaker section, but he stood out to me today. And today was also the first time we've really got to see Chris Mitchell turn loose since the first practice. And, you know, it, it's not that he hasn't, been doing that in practice just the things that we've seen have not been conducive to him really turning it loose and so it was nice to see him out there today getting vertical showing off his speed showing off his suddenness I, I thought he had a pretty a, a very good day it was good to see him out there I thought Deion Colsey continues to to look solid you know nothing spectacular today went through drills well you know his quickness is there he's getting in and out of breaks well which is good because he's had some knee issues in the past you know, and the biggest thing with Dion is, is he catching the ball consistently? And it, the the day the the first practice that we saw him after he had the surgery on his hand, it was, it was not pretty. The ball was hitting the ground a lot, which you kind of expect. The guy just had surgery on his hand. But the last two practices we've been at, dion has been very sharp catching the football. And today was no different. I again, I'm not saying he didn't drop a pass. I didn't see every rep that he took because I'm trying to watch different parts of it. But in every rep that I saw him take today. He caught the ball well. He he showed good sideline awareness, which Dion hasn't done in the past all the time. Meaning, I'm running my corner route. I got to know where if the ball's coming, and and where the sideline is. And Dion showed better awareness today to you know keep that one foot in, catch the ball, and then you know get an extra step before he went out of bounds. So I thought Dion had a solid day. KK Smith had another solid day. Very smooth athlete, like what I see from KK. And the big thing was. That, that I thought, and I wouldn't read too much into this because they do mix things up a lot, but the guy running with the first team at the boundary receiver was Micah Gilbert. And I've heard a, I've heard a lot of things about Micah Gilbert from different sources. And he's having a really good spring. Like when we talked about Micah, when they signed him, I, I anticipated him having a chance to come in and, 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 you know, push a little bit early because he's an advanced, but he's big. He's 6'2", he's strong, he's over 200, well over 200 pounds, long arms. He's just, he's a smart football player. He knows how to get open. He's, you know, knows how to run routes. He's a smart kid, knows how to find his, his, you know, some room to run. The thing that's been surprising for me is I thought Micah was a good athlete, but he's been an even better athlete than I anticipated. And that's always what you want to see when you, when you evaluate a guy on film and you like what you see, you want to, you want to either have it confirmed when you see him in person or maybe even better than what you thought it would be in person. And so with Micah Gilbert, I graded him as a top 150 caliber guy. He was borderline top 100 guy. Wasn't quite there yet. And one of the reasons why was just be, was something he he can't really control at that time, which was his intangible grade was a little bit lower because he'd been battled some injuries and his production before senior year wasn't great. You know, there's been guys that have had way, way, way more production. You know, so like Rico Flores, his intangible grade is going to be quite a bit higher than Micah Gilbert's because tremendous production, you know, it was always healthy, you know, the program he played in all this other kind of stuff. And that was something that, you know, Micah had a really great senior year, but he hadn't been able to stay healthy the two previous years and, and had never even had, I don't believe 500 yards receiving in a season. And then the other one was he had good athleticism grades, but he didn't have great athleticism grades. And so that obviously brought him down a little bit on the, on the chart, but I did give him four and a half star upside. So I knew that there was some potential there, but I'll be honest, he's much further along than I thought he would be like, like, I don't want to sit here and be like, Hey, we, we always said he could play as a freshman. He might be able to play as a freshman. So, so we, we saw this coming. We knew he was going to be really good. 
I thought I liked Micah Gilbert a lot. I, I I thought he was very underrated. We talked about this. I thought he could push early on, but folks, we're halfway through spring ball and Micah Gilbert's playing like a starter. I mean, that's how he's performing in practice, and that I did not see coming. Like I didn't think he'd be that far along this early, and and there's two reasons for it. Number one is he's strong, which helps him to kind of make a quick adjustment. But Cam Williams is also strong. The second part, and this is what really separates Micah and Cam, is Micah is a, is a more advanced, nuanced player. He's, he has a better understanding of route running. He has a better understanding of how to get open, where Cam was just a dynamic athlete that, that would line up in the backfield, a receiver, defense, and all these things. And Cam was just a dynamic athlete that would get the ball a lot of different ways, but he was never stressed to the point where he had to like become a precise route runner. Mike is much further along in that regard. And, and so that has helped him quite a bit. And that you kind of expected. But the third thing that, that, that he's shown that is a bit of a surprise is he's more athletic than I thought he was going to be. He's quicker coming out of his stance. He's quicker getting out of breaks. He's, he accelerates better than I thought he was going to do. His body control is even better than I thought it was. And that's one of the athletic things I liked the most about him was how – you know, he was very – he could really turn and attack the football. And and the balance he shows and the hip fle- flexibility shows when fighting for the football has really impressed me. And that's probably the, the been the biggest surprise for me is not that he is athletic, but to the degree to which he's done it. The nuance as a route runner, I expected that. Being strong as a rookie, anyone that's ever seen Micah Gilbert in person, which I have been at, at games, like that's a strong kid. And then you see the film, you're like, that kid's not going to get pushed around as a freshman. It's the it's the speed at which with he with which he plays the game that has really surprised me. And his ability to absorb the playbook this quickly has been something that surprises me. Not surprising that I didn't think he was capable of it, but I know this offense. It is not an easy offense to learn in seven practices for anyone, a fifth year senior, much less a freshman. And so Micah Gilbert's ability to process that and then go play with confidence, because there's a difference between learning the playbook to where I could go draw the plays up on a board and then learning the offense where I can listen to the coach say it. And I'm and within two seconds, I'm lined up knowing exactly what I need to do. I know my route. I know my route if against off man. I know my route against against press man. I know my route if he's playing me inside. I know my route if he's playing me outside. I know my route if he squats on me post snap. I know my route if he bails post snap. I know my route if he jumps from outside to in post snap. I know my route. If he if he widens outside, you guys see what I'm saying? These are all the things that kids have to process in seconds. And so that's why reps are so important. And Micah just he looks so comfortable doing all these things. And that's the been the interesting thing is I'll I'll be straight with you. Just from what we've seen in practices, again, we haven't seen Chris Mitchell do a lot. They haven't used him to do a lot. We haven't seen some of these other guys do a lot, but but what of what we have seen, Jaden Greathouse. And Micah Gilbert have been the two most impressive looking receivers for me. And Jaden is just kind of out in front of everybody right now. He his he, he's got that total package. But Micah reminds me a lot of Jaden last year, but he's bigger. And and he and he uh you know ha, is better built for the boundary where Jaden could play boundary, but ideally you want him as a field guy. Micah looks to be at least an inch taller, at least 10 to 15 pounds thicker than what Jaden was a year ago. And and so uh I I was been really impressed by those guys. And it's not that, you know, oh, man, you know, Chris Mitchell's not as good as I hoped he would be. And, and Deion Colsey just, you know, he the light hasn't gone on for Deion. And, you know, there's no Jordan phase on. And, and Cam Williams isn't as good as I hoped he would be. And what well, this Jane Harrison guy can't do? And it's not because of anything negative with anybody else. I have not seen a receiver yet where I'm like, that guy's having a rough spring. The only guy that I can say that about is Jaden Her- Thomas because he just hasn't been – I don't want to say hasn't been healthy because I don't know that it's an injury. We haven't spoken to Marcus Freeman since he started being banged up. And so, uh, but he's just not getting a lot of reps, but of the guy, I'm very happy with what I've seen from the receiving core. And I'll talk more about it in in the third section, but I'm, I'm very happy with it, but it's just that these two guys have just been that good. And we saw that again today. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the offensive line. I'm going to jump to some conclusions here uh, just so you all understand that there's a difference between what I know and what I'm thinking. And so I'm going to tell you what I saw today and then give you my 100% opinion on what it could mean. And I'm saying that because I don't want anyone to be confused 
to think that I'm sharing intel or giving information or whatever the case may be. But we saw today, so I first noticed it during individual drills. So I've got the quarterbacks in front of me with the receivers and then down on the opposite side of the field is the offensive line. So I'm kind of in the corner of the end zone so I can watch the receivers and quarterbacks and running backs here, but I also have the offensive line in view on the opposite side. And so, and the other reason I focus on the offense only is because when they're inside, the offense and defense are on the same field. So I can kind of watch a little bit of everything. But today, since we're outside, the defense is on one field, the offense is on another field, and it's very hard for one person to see all of it. So I focus on the offense today. So we saw uh, what we saw about for the offensive line was they were down there working on, on drills. And there's a few things that I liked that I saw today. Number one, all the drills they were doing early were to uh, focus on drive blocking and and put driving their feet through contact. You could see it, it was a very it was being emphasized quite a bit today. And that's important because what was one of my biggest issues last year with the Notre Dame offensive line? It was they were hitting and they even when they would come off of force they would hit and then they would stop their feet and and just take the contact. They weren't catching like we've seen from, from past offensive lines. And, and so it wasn't, you know, oh, this is Jeff Quinn all over again. It wasn't that so much. It was that they weren't moving their feet the way they needed to. And, and even with that initial footwork, and then especially at the point of contact, there was that, there was that smack point. And then the defensive line would kind of move their feet and the offensive line would not move theirs. And they would, there was just a lot of stalemating. I don't like stalemating on the offensive line. In most instances, there are some plays where if I'm running, if I'm running inside zone, I'm kind of turning and base blocking my that wide rusher. I don't care about getting a dominant block on him because we're going inside of him to backside. It doesn't really matter. But most runs, I don't want stalemates. I want movement. I want to get vertical or lateral movement depending on the play that we're running. And so what we saw today was Coach Rudolph working a lot on the timing of double teams to get vertical movement. And they were doing it two ways. One was working with, you know, a, a, a two offensive linemen working against another offensive lineman. This is something that Coach Eastan did a lot of as well. And so you'd see like the front guy and then the linebacker would both be offensive linemen. So they're just, you know, working on if he goes here, you 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 get off this way. So working on it there. But then they were also doing a lot of stuff on on one man sleds. They were having one guy come off and just work on drive blocks. So really, you know, get your get your base low, explode your hips through contact, get that vertical lift. You see some guys like they get leaning out and they like put the sled out and they lunge down. That's not good. You want to get up underneath that sucker, lift that thing up and drive with your hips and your lower body, drive that sled back. And so they were working on that today on a one man sled, which I was very happy to see. You always want to see that from offensive linemen. But here's the thing that was interesting. They had the centers working over here, and they had the tackles working somewhere, and then they had the guards were both working on the sleds. So the guards were together, but you had the left guards on the one side and the right guards on the other side. Well, here's what we saw today that I thought was interesting. We saw Rocco Spindler at left guard, which is where Pat Coogan plays. So I thought that was interesting. And then we also then saw that when they went to the team period, they followed up with the team period, Rocco Spindler was a left guard. Well, from what we have seen up to this point in time, Rocco's been a right guard where him and Billy Shrouth have battled. So now that Rocco's a left guard, what that tells me is that Billy Shrouth has basically – this is my this is where it's my opinion. So what I know is everything I just told you is what I know. My opinion is that leads me to believe – that one of two things is true. One is they're just working Rocco both sides, and it could very well be that. It could very well be Rocco's playing both left and right, which would be smart, in my opinion. But what it also tells me is even if that is true, it tells me they feel like Billy Shrouth has kind of locked down that right guard spot. And and that's kind of that, okay, that's his, that's his spot. And then at left guard, now you've got Rocco over there, which means either one of two things is true from that. Either Rocco is now just working on becoming the swing guy, or now he's going to be at left guard where he's going to battle Pat Coogan. My, that's what I hope is going on. We'll, we'll we'll see if that's actually what's going on. And I, I have to say, I kind of started thinking about the potential of a big physical kid like Rocco and a 
big monster like Charles Jagasaw playing beside each other on the left side, run game wise, that kind of has me a little bit fired up. My only criticism would be now, unless Billy Shrouth just can't play left-handed, which could be true because Billy started off at left guard lash and they moved him right guard. I still would have liked seeing your more athletic duo on the left side where your pass blocking is going to be key. But uh, Pat Coogan wasn't a great pass blocker last year either. So I'm very curious to see if this continues in future practices or not. So again, pure speculation on my part. I'm, I'm being very open and honest about it. And part of it is because that's what I want to see. And I'm very curious to see if we see more of that in future practices. So, you know, we get one, I think one more this Saturday. I think that's the last practice we get. I believe I have to look at the schedule, but I think this Saturday is, is in, uh, is the last practice we're going to get. I'm very curious to see if we see, Rocco back at right guard, or if he stays a left guard for this period of time. So very, very, very interesting. The other interesting thing is we saw Sam Pendleton as the number two center. This is now the second or third practice in a row that I'd have to go check my notes that we've seen Sam Pendleton at center as the number two center. Now, I thought that was really fascinating. Once again, that tells me that they're feeling like they are starting to get some ideas on who their guards are going to be. And they're also making sure that they've got their center depth chart figured out. And Sam Pendleton's a guy that I, I, I would assume that this is a bit of a cross-training situation. That doesn't mean that Sam can't lock down that number two center spot. But if I were a betting man, and I'm not, but if I were, I would say that that Sam is getting this work because they want him to learn center. But if there was a needed guard, he'd still be a guy that they would consider putting out there a guard. And so he's kind of getting that number two center job. It would seem to me that he's kind of solidifying himself there. And I, I don't know what that means about Joe Wadding. Maybe he just isn't ready yet, or maybe they felt like this is just more of what they need from Sam Pendleton, that they want to be able to cross-train him a little bit. And we expect Sam to be a, a further ahead than Joe because Joe has a lot more need for you know, size and strength and those type of things to, to grow and, and get to the point where he needs to be uh, for that as well. So those are things that, that, um, that we saw from the offensive line today. That's what we saw from the receivers today. That's what I saw from Notre Dame during their practice today. So went a little bit longer on that than I than I thought I would, but I got fired up talking about the quarterbacks. And you guys know how I get when I start talking about quarterbacks and receivers. I, I get a little bit crazy with it. So um, I, I enjoyed seeing that. I'm going to get into parts two and three next for those who join late. Part two is going to be about the Notre Dame depth being tested this spring. And what does that mean for Notre Dame? What's What, what are the positives about it? What are the things to be concerned about? And then part three is we're starting to see some playmakers emerge from Notre Dame. Who are those players? What does it mean? And then who also are we still waiting on to see step up uh, as playmakers this year? So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing these guys continue to emerge on the Saturday practice, blue gold game, and then, of course, going into fall. But you never want to leave spring where you're like, I don't really know who, who wants to be a playmaker or not. And I'm going to also talk about what this means in regard to what the offense could look like next year based on a comment that Mike Denbrock made at uh, the practice at the uh, post-practice interview on Saturday, which I thought was really cool. It was in response to a question I asked him about how the offseason, how, how he builds his team. So we'll get into that as well. And so I was uh, very, very pleased with his answer on that. So before we get into that, folks, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast. If you have not done so, give us a five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate that. And, of course, make sure that you are on the message boards at boards.irishbreakdown.com. It's a great way to support Irish Breakdown. If you are someone who uh, just enjoys the free content that we give on this show and on the podcast, and you actually want to support us in a way that helps us grow our business, which we would greatly appreciate, then that's a way to do it. You don't have to be a message board person to do that. You can just you know, be a member and, and knowing that supports us. You can also join one of the booster clubs, either the the uh, Shamrock Club, the Blue Club, or the Gold Club, which will then get you some free merch if you sign up for that. So if you go to boards.arsbreakdown.com, go to the join section, you'll see those sections. I've kind of explained it. So there's lots of great info on there, but if you're not someone who spends time on the board, you still want to support us, this is a great way to do that. We've had, had some people do that as well. And we agree, greatly, greatly appreciate that. So I'll be back here in a minute with part two of today's show on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I always get nervous when my wife brought me down a tea.
during the first section session, the first portion of the show, I always get nervous drinking it on, on uh, camera for the first time because this mug that she got me does a great job of keeping things really hot. So it could be sitting there for half an hour and still be really hot. And so I'm always afraid that I'm going to take that first sip and a little too big and just burn. And then I spill it everywhere and I will never live that down. So it always makes me a little bit nervous uh, when I'm when I'm taking those first sips of tea after she brings it to me. Let's get into part two of today's show. Part two of today's show is is really interesting because. We are seeing Notre Dame's depth chart be very, uh, very tested this spring at a lot of positions, especially on offense. And it's being tested for multiple reasons, and they mean different things. And we have seen more little bumps and bruises from offensive players this spring. We've seen some guys that came into spring with some some injuries, obviously, that were already there, which is kind of, you know, kind of part of the process. But we've seen some new injuries emerge. And we'll talk about some of the things we've seen on defense as well, because there, there are some things in the defense. But it's forcing the depth to really be tested. And then there's another way where, where depth can be tested, which is do you have guys that really step up and show themselves to be, hey, I'm ready to push you. So there's two different ways that depth can have an impact, positively or negatively. One is the the negative is you don't have enough guys to to put a team out there if you have some injuries. And and then number two, where depth can be an issue is you don't have enough good players pushing older players. So there's not that same level of of I'm trying to think of the right word that I want to use here. Uh, there's just a greater sense of urgency. With, with players, when you know the guy behind you is a way, way, way not as good as you, like way behind you, either in development or talent or whatever the case may be, naturally with young people, and I'm speaking from experience as a player and speaking from experience as a coach, sometimes with some younger players, there can be a little bit of complacency that sets in. Not that you're not working hard, but you just don't have that same, you know, that, that same urgency where you know i can't take today off because if i take today off or if i don't bring it today this young kid behind me is going to go off and i'm going to find myself fighting for a job or or not even fight for a job on the bench and that's a great place to be and so you want that you don't want to just have guys that kind of just know they're the guy because they're so much better than everybody else behind them and, and so you're seeing a little bit of that this spring as well. And we'll dive into that, one position especially. But I want to begin with just some of the areas where Notre Dame is being tested from a depth standpoint this year, this spring, and what it means. And and some of the good and the bad. And we'll begin with quarterback. Obviously, this is a position that's a spotlight for a lot of people. And, and it's a position we all care about. It's also a position that's incredibly important for Notre Dame and their future. Notre Dame, I was watching, they did this, the ACC Network has this weird number one series where they'll go back and like look at past national champions. They had one on the 90 Georgia Tech team, and they had one on the 99 Florida State team. Well, they had one recently on the 81 Clemson team, which I thought was 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 really good. And you just, you're, you're kind of watching it, and they were, they were, um, they were kind of talking. I'm trying. I kind of lost my lost my thought on that one, but oh, they were. Oh, this is what it was. They they he said uh, they were talking about the. I think it was Homer Jordan was the name was the quarterback at Clemson at the time, and they basically said like, look, you can't win a championship without a dynamic quarterback, and just kind of made me chuckle because I'm like, how many times we've said that at Notre Dame, and how a big reason why that 91 that 81 Clemson team was so good that year was because of their quarterback Homer Jordan. And I didn't even remember Homer Jordan. I was three years old when Clemson won that championship. So I, I don't remember Homer Jordan. I, the only guys I really remember from that team is I remember Terry Kennard. And I remember Refrigerator Perry, right? I remember him. And I think his brother Michael Dean was also on that team, I believe. And obviously he played for the Broncos. So those are the only guys I really remember from that team. I don't remember the running back. I didn't remember the quarterback. I barely remember Danny Ford as their head coach because I was three. And when I say remember it, it's more about, you know, when, when I was older, I'd look back on those teams. So I didn't know a lot of those guys. So it was really cool to watch that. If you if you see it on TV, check it out. But it, you know, look, that's true for Notre Dame. It, it, but the the concern and the problem is is 
you don't know who that if they have that kind of guy. And if he they do have that guy, let's say it is Riley Leonard and you have that guy, that's great. But what if Riley Leonard gets hurt? Or what if Riley Leonard is not that guy? What you can see happen is, is when the first guy either A, doesn't pan out, or B, gets hurt, sometimes it's both, C, both, all of the above, then you're in a situation where your team cannot meet expectations because you don't have the depth of talent at quarterback to be successful. Notre Dame has four scholarship quarterbacks. I'm not concerned about numbers. If Notre Dame has three scholarship quarterbacks, I'm not concerned about numbers. Numbers only become a problem if you get down to two. But what I'm concerned about is the depth of talent at Notre Dame. And and it's rare. I think 2022 was one of the few years where I was actually worried about the numbers at quarterback. Well, I don't know if they have enough numbers to get through a practice and get through a season. You had, once Tyler Buckner got hurt, you had basically what? You had Drew Pine and Steve Angeli. That was it. You didn't really have anybody else. That's a problematic number standpoint, and you're young, and, and you wonder, like, do you have the talent to even win there? So it's been rare that it's been both, but it, it does happen from time to time. More so the issue has been if this guy gets hurt or doesn't pan out or isn't as good as we hope, they're in trouble because they don't have anybody to turn to. With this team, we're learning more and more about that depth part. Like, look, we know who Riley Leonard is, and if you don't know who Riley Leonard is, watch more film. I mean, seriously, just go and don't just pick and choose a game here and there. Go watch a lot of his games. I put a there's a thread on the message board at Irish Breakdown where I put up like eight or nine of his games from the last two years. And you can go watch them. You know, watch the games where he didn't play well. Watch the games where he did play very well. Watch the games where maybe his numbers weren't good. But you're like, man, that that offense looked pretty good. And then you watch him there like, well, he he didn't put up great numbers against Clemson. But the only reason they beat Clemson is because of his playmaking ability. And then you can see how he impacts the entire defense. So, look. If you if you know Ball and you've seen enough of him, you know who Riley Leonard is, and that's 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 both the good and the bad. You know what his strengths are. You know how dynamic he is. You know the playmaker he is. You know what he can do with his arm. You know what he can do with his legs. You know all those things. But you also know the areas where he's. You know you're not going to ask him to go be this guy. You're not going to go ask him to be a 79 percent passer. That's not his game. Is he is is he inaccurate? No, he's not inaccurate. Is he a precision Drew pre Drew Brees type passer? No, he's not that either. And so you know, you know the positives and you know the concerns, or not the concerns, but the areas where he's not quite as good. You know who he is. And I've said this before. If he simply plays exactly the same way in 2024 that he played in his one year as a starter at Duke in 2022, I'm not talking production-wise, because the production will be impacted by what's around him. But if he just plays that way, make the throws you made in 2022. Do what you did in 2022 with your legs. This is going to be a special offense because he's going to have so much better talent around him to support him. Way better talent at running back, with all due respect to the Duke kids. Way better talent at receiver and tight end. And, and all the offensive line is an experience as the one that he had at Duke his last couple of years. It's a lot more talented. And, I mean, the his top quarter, his top pass catcher the last two years at Duke I've said this before, was the kid who he beat out the previous spring of 2022 for the starting quarterback job. The backup quarterback, the, the guy that got beat out of quarterback goes to receiver and leads him in receptions the next two years. That That's that's what he was working with there. At Notre Dame, it's obviously a different story. So we know who Riley Leonard is. The disappointing thing this spring for him has been he's missing a lot of the team reps. Now, there are things they're doing to make sure he's still throwing the ball. He's still working on timing and getting that kind of stuff going. But there's a lot of team reps that he's just not getting. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can hope you can get him make up in the summer and in the fall. So, you know, that's a concern. However, that's the, that's the negative. There is no, but this is a good thing for Notre Dame. Yes and no. The best thing for Notre Dame is that Riley Leonard is healthy and not needing follow-up procedures and all this other kind of stuff. And he can just go out there and practice. That's the best thing for Notre Dame. So, Anyone's just telling you, know, it's, it's better for Notre Dame that Riley Leonard's out or whatever. Like, oh, not really. You know, it'd be better if he was healthy and developing, but he's not. So it's not so much that it's better. It's about, okay, well, well, what are you going to get out of it? What are you going to make of it? What, what are you going to say? Hey, look, this is the hands that were dealt, so let's make the most of it. And that is where Notre Dame is right now, quarterback. And that is because we are seeing a lot more reps for Steve Angeli. We're seeing a lot more reps for Kenny Minchie and C.J. Carr. And those guys are going to be pushed in ways that maybe they weren't, especially with Kenny and CJ, if Riley was healthy. And what we're seeing is, is like, look, we don't know from what we have seen where 
Kenny is from a you know running the offense standpoint, or where CJ is from running the offense standpoint. We kind of know where Steve is to a degree. I would still contend that starting the Sun Bowl after a month of work does not indicate how you will play in a game at Texas A&M or a game at home against Florida State when you have a week to prepare. So there's still a lot of uncertainty, even with Steve, a guy that we've seen. And that's always true of a guy that you've never really seen him play a lot before. And some guys are fine. I mean, CJ, CJ Stroud took over in 2022, having not – I don't think he attempted a single pass in 2021, I believe. Or was it – no, he took over in 2021, having not thrown, I believe, a single pass in 2020. So some guys are fine. But it's still it's still a question mark until you see it, and so what we're seeing from these guys is limited because we haven't seen them run the offense. But here's what we have seen, and I talked about this earlier in the show: the arm talent in that room is as good as it's been at Notre Dame since probably early 2014. Just God given natural ability. And and you could argue it might be better because it's it's got one more. In 2014, the quarterback room with Everett Golson, Malik Zaire, and Deshaun Kaiser was really impressive. I mean, it was incredibly impressive because now Deshaun was a freshman and Malik was still unproven. He'd only had he had to start that one start against LSU. Malik threw less than 100 yards in that game, right? So we still didn't know what kind of thrower could Malik be. And we didn't know what Deshaun could be. But if you just look at him and just pure God give him arm talent, it was impressive. I mean, ever I've said this, Everett Golson's thrown the ball, throws the ball as well as any quarterback at Notre Dame that I've seen person. The only other one that that is throws it a little better than him was Jimmy Clausen. That's it. I mean, nobody throws. I mean, Everett and Malik will tell you that. Other guys on the team will tell you that. It it Everett could just spin it beautifully. His arm talent was amazing. Deshaun had a lot of arm talent, you know, big kid, big strong right arm. You know, could power the ball in different places, threw a great deep ball. And then, of course, Malik might have had the strongest arm I've seen since Tony Rice. I mean, he has an absolute bazooka, you know, connected to his left shoulder. And and so there was a lot of different arm talent that was, you know, that was on that roster. Well, this year, you don't have quite the power that that d- group had. You know, Everett had a cannon. Malik had a bazooka. Deshaun had a really strong arm. But what you have – now is not quite that same power that that group had, but arm talent that's impressive nonetheless in different ways. Arm speed, ball placement is much better than that 2014 group was. You know, Mal- Malik was still learning. It was, I think, Malik, that was going to be 2014 was Malik's second year at Notre Dame, and Deshaun was a true freshman. So it'd be like if it was just Riley, Kenny, and CJ. Right. Like it's they're still young and and learning, but these kids are so much more advanced technically than that group was that, you know, they've just they come. I mean, Malik was running an option offense in high school. Deshaun was a a more of a traditional offense, but even him, he didn't have to necessarily carry the team the way that CJ had to or the way that Kenny had to in high school. But the arm talent is really outstanding. And, And the guy that I've been the most critical of and rightfully so is having the least amount of arm talent is Steve Angeli still has really good arm talent. I, I, I'll i say it again. Notre Dame can win 10 games next year with Steve Angeli quarterback, maybe more. My question has always been, but that's not the standard. The standard is, can you win a championship? Notre Dame proved they could go 12-0 and in the regular season with Ian Book as, as a starting quarterback. Okay, great. They proved also that they couldn't win anything in the postseason with Ian Book a quarterback. That That's just the reality of it. So is Steve a guy that can win that next level? That's debatable. But what you're seeing from Steve – even him and I and I use him because I've said before he's at the kind of the bottom of my list of, of arm talent. Is you're still seeing a kid that has a lot of moxie, a lot of savviness, a lot of uh, you know really good football IQ, and a guy that that can spin the ball pretty well. He doesn't have a ton of experience. I don't think he's yet to throw for three thousand yards in his entire life in, in high school and college combined. He's right around there because it was less than a thousand as a junior threw for like 1,700 as a senior, and then threw for like, what, five-something last year. So he's still learning, but there's it's good arm talent. And I feel a lot better right now about the ability of Steve Angeli to go into a game and have to throw the ball 30 times than I did when Drew Pine was on the field in 2022. That's just, a, that's just the reality of it. You know, there was what was in 2020. It was Brandon Clark, 
Brendan Clark. So if, if something happened to Drew Pine, I mean, excuse me, if something happened to, to Ian Book in 2020, who were you turning to, Brendan Clark or, Drew, or true freshman Drew Pine? That was a problem. In 2021, you had Jack Cohn, redshirt freshman Drew Pine, and true freshman Tyler Buckner. But Tyler Buckner was hadn't played football in a couple of years. You know, and, and Tyler Buckner was a guy that was at that time more of a, of a runner than he was a thrower. So it, it, it was problematic. In 2022, if Tyler Buckner gets hurt or doesn't pan out, there's a pretty big drop-off on your uh, with that next guy as far as someone that's good enough to take you to the next level. We said about Drew Pine back then, Drew Pine can win you 10 games. And if Drew Pine would have been Notre Dame starting quarterback that entire year, at worst they're 9-3 and three, in my opinion because I think Drew probably would have given you a little bit better chance to beat Marshall. I, I, you know, maybe I still say Tyler being used properly would have helped them win that game a little bit more, but it's a different conversation for a different day. Drew would have fit the game plan. They were using that game a little bit better, but it was a big drop off after the number one guy. And, and the number one guy was a, a player in Tyler Buckner that still had major concerns as a thrower. He had major concerns from an, from a health standpoint. Now you look at this room and you're saying right now, based on what we saw today, it's Riley Leonard would, it'd be the projected starter, then Steve Angeli, then Kenny Minchie, then C.J. Carr. Having a guy like C.J. Carr, or if you flip those two, and it's Kenny Minchie, or if you flip all of them and it's Steve Angeli at number four, the, the arm talent you have in your two, three, four spots is as good as it's been in a very, very long time. And I know that Brian and Ryan talked about this a little bit yesterday. But the, the, the benefit of Riley Leonard being out, and again, it's not what you prefer, is that these guys are getting a ton more reps. And we're now seeing it, and they're being pushed. They're being stressed. They're saying, hey – you may not have thought you were battling for the starting job this year, but now you are. And I think that's that's certainly been a, a positive. And you look at receiver, you know, we were having a discussion on the board last week. Somebody had asked, I think it was this weekend, somebody had asked, does Notre Dame have too many receivers? Which I thought was an interesting way, a question to ask. Especially when you consider the lack of pro, the problems they've had with depth. But when the poster clarified it, the, the point he was making was, do they have too many good receivers you know, meaning, you know, there are too many mouths to feed. And that's a more fair question. I think, think that is a more fair question. I would say my answer is still be no, but I understand the point that he was making. However, today you're seeing an example of why it's important to have that kind of numbers. Because you don't have Jane Thomas. You don't have Jaden Harrison. You don't have Jordan Faison. Now, two of the, one of those guys, because he's playing lacrosse, which won't be an issue in the fall. But the other two are injuries. And Jaden Thomas has had a hard time staying on the field at Notre Dame. It's just a fact. And Deion Colsey has had a hard time staying healthy at Notre Dame. And so you're, you're looking at some of these guys and you're saying Bo Collins is, is, has had some injury history as well, Clemson. So you're looking at it saying this is why you need the depth that you need. You have. Because you don't know. Because there's with receivers, there's so many different things that a receiver can get hit her by. Concussions are, are are not as high as they used to be, but still a part of playing receiver. It's not like it used to be because you can't get smashed over the middle as much as you can. Guys come down and go up and catch a high ball, come down, hit their head, they get banged up. You, you, the soft tissue injuries are much more prominent receiver, in my opinion, than they are an offensive line. And and maybe they they happen the same amount, but a receiver they can keep you out. Where offensive line maybe can you know play through it. And so what you're seeing is a, a day like today where in your two deep, you have two freshmen in your two deep today because you, where you are with numbers, because you don't have Bo Collins, you don't have Jordan Faison, you don't have Logan Saldate who weren't, who weren't like really technically part of the team today because Jordan's you know playing lacrosse. He was out there, I believe, and going through warmups, but he's not going through drills. He's not, go, he's not part, participating in practice. Bo Collins can't go through it. And then you don't have Jaden Thomas and you don't have Jaden Harrison. So now all of a sudden you're missing – so if they have, what is 11, so you have Chris Mitchell, Jaden Harrison, the two veteran, Bo Collins, two transfers. Then you have Jaden Thomas, Deion Colsey, that's five. And then you have the three sophomores, right? So you'd have Jaden Jaden Greathouse, K.K. Smith, and Jordan Faison. And then the three freshmen, Cam Williams, Micah Gilbert, and um, Logan Saldate. Well, today you're down five of those guys. Jordan Faison's playing lacrosse. Bo Collins can't practice. Jane Thomas is not, for whatever reason, I I, I want to say injured, but I I, I feel that's irresponsible because I haven't been told he's injured and I haven't heard it back from anybody about him being injured. So he's just not practicing. Like he's going through, you know, stretching individual. That's it. We don't see him anything else. And today you didn't have Jane Harrison available. Now all of a sudden, 
Micah Gilbert's with the ones and Cam Williams is with the twos. K.K. Smith has to move inside, and all of a sudden things are in flux. And you're seeing this at tight end as well with, with no Mitchell Evans. And, and what it has done is it shows you why it's so important that this ha- that you have the depth. You say, well, you have too many players. Well, this is exactly why you need that many playmakers, not just bodies, but guys that can play. Because with as many guys that have had the, the, the injury history as we've seen, you, you can't be in a position where you got one really, really good player, but if he goes down, you know, what happens? I mean, think about this. What happens if Will Fuller gets hurt in 2015? early in the year and misses like six, seven games completely changes that football team because you didn't have any other guys like that. Now that's an extreme example, but we've seen it in recent years. Boy, I tell you what, if Kevin Austin doesn't step up in 2021, this receiving core is going to be in trouble. And when Kevin Austin played well, their name's pass offense was really scary. When Kevin Austin didn't play well. Their name's pass offense really struggled. It was determined by one guy in 2022. If Lorenzo styles doesn't break out and have that sophomore surge, in year two, in 2022, the receiving core is going to struggle. He didn't step up. He didn't have that surge for whatever reason. I'm not trying to get into why, but it just that's the reality of it. And the pass game struggled. This year, the nice thing is what we're learning about this receiving core is with the guys out, we're seeing more and more guys be forced into situations where they have to step up and play. And so far, it's been really impressive to see that they've done that. So with certain guys out, you're seeing a lot more of K.K. Smith running with twos this spring, and he looks good doing it. With certain guys out, you know, with, with Jaden Thomas being banged up, with Bo Collins not being part of the team yet, that's forced Micah Gilbert to have to play. Now, the good news is, is Micah, Bell's answered the, Micah Gilbert's answered the bell. You know, with Jordan Faison playing lacrosse. Look, this notion that with Jordan Faison playing lacrosse, that's allowed – Jaden Greathouse to emerge as the starter. I don't think that's accurate because I think if Jaden if Jaden Ta- Greathouse doesn't get hurt, and if other players don't get hurt, which force him away from the slot, Jaden Greathouse is your starting slot. Jordan Faison took over when Jaden had to move somewhere else. The expectation, from what I knew and from what I had been told, was always that Jaden Greathouse was going to be a starter for you at Notre Dame this year. So I don't think that's fair to say Jordan is. You know, hurt himself by playing lacrosse. I don't think that's fair. Jaden Greathouse was going to be the starter. Jordan's going to play a bunch, no matter who's the first guy on the field. But what it has done is with so many new players, with Jaden Thomas being a little bit banged up for most of the spring, with no Jordan Faison, now you say, okay, Greathouse, we need you to be that dude. He has to be that dude. And so far this spring, he has been that dude. K.K. Smith being thrust into extra reps because there's no Jordan Faison, and now because Jane Harrison is out, and you know Cam Williams is still learning, and so now we've seen I've seen more of K.K. Smith. Guess what K.K. Smith is doing? He's a baller, right? He's out there making plays, and and so it is very encouraging for me. At tight ends, the same thing. No Mitchell Evans this spring, so guess who's had a breakout spring for Notre Dame so far? Eli Raritan's been limited. Mitchell Evans is out. Cooper Flanagan is thrust into the lineup. And what has Cooper done this spring so far from everything I've seen and heard? He's he's out there making a ton of plays. And, and so you've seen that happen th- at those two positions. And then at running back as well. You know, we've seen Kedron Young banged up a lot. I don't I don't know what's going on with Jabron Payne. I don't know if he's – I mean, he's out there. He's at practice. We see him go through drills. But then they go through the first, second, and third team, and Jabron's not in there. I don't know if there's an injury. I don't know what the situation is. But the fact is is that you are missing out – on two really talented running backs. And so what happens? Aeneas Williams steps into that number three role, and he looks good. And so what you're seeing is, is you're, this spring, because the depth, is, the depth is being tested, we're learning two things about Notre Dame. Number one is that they have a lot, they have a lot of quality depth. That's, that's a big thing. A lot of quality depth at very important positions, quarterback, running back, receiver, tight end. You're seeing that happen a lot on offense. Very, very deep offensive football team. But what you're also seeing, in my opinion, this spring is how good the coaching is for this offensive staff at the skill positions because you're watching three quarterbacks take reps and you're like, do they have starting caliber play going on right now without their starter being out there? Technically speaking, I mean, like I said today, when 
when the when you're out there and your receivers are throwing and it's on time and it's accurate, now, yes, they have arm talent, but this is also a group that's clearly been prepared. I talk about CJ Carr going out there and just being comfortable and and part of that's on CJ being smart and putting in the work, but the other part of that is you can't ignore the fact that you have to give credit to Gino Gadouli for helping to get these kids prepared for what they're about to go do. And same thing with with running back. Yeah, you've got Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price, but you know, where's DeBron Payne at? Where's Kedron Young? Those guys are banged up, I think. I know Kedron is because Marcus Freeman's talked about it. I don't know what's going on with DeBron Payne. Maybe they're just hiding him and they don't want the media to see him for some reason. I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe he's only a nickel running back. I have no clue why he's not getting a lot of reps, but I've yet to see Jabron Payne take a rep in any kind of team fashion. And today was another example. And when you can have two guys like that out and you're able to put in a kid like Aeneas Williams as your number three, and you're like, that kid's really good. It speaks volumes about not, not only the depth of talent, but it also speaks volumes about the preparation. And that's something I'm very encouraged by. And, and offensive line, we're seeing the depth really thrive this spring as well. People have asked, why are you only taking three offensive linemen in the 2025 class? Like, well, because they have a lot of young linemen that are talented on the roster now. And you're seeing that happen. You're seeing veteran players that were ranked kind of high coming out, kind of getting passed up by younger players. You know, you're seeing, you know, maybe we're not as comfortable with that number two center job, or maybe you've got a guy like, like Sam Pendleton who – Maybe maybe they are comfortable with Joe Otting right now, and I've heard good things about Joe Otting, but maybe it's a situation where well, we love Sam Pendleton. we got to find a way to get this kid into the two deep, but right now with Billy Shrouth and with, with Pat Coogan and with Rocco Spindler, maybe there's just not that space for him. So, hey, let's, let's have this kid play some center. Well, you're seeing with the offensive line as well that, look, dude, you know, this you've got some deep talent there to work with, especially inside. So you've got a lot of different things that you can do and a lot of things you've gotten, you, you can work at. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to see that. And that's a, a place where the depth is a, has been a positive this spring where it's, it's resulting in pushing guys are being pushed this spring in ways like maybe we wouldn't have seen in the past. And so offensively, what you're, what you've learned about this football team this spring is that the depth that we hoped that they had has already been tested and has been shown, and it has not been shown wanting, in my opinion. It is shown to be this guy goes down, next guy goes balls out, and he's making plays. This guy goes down, so this guy steps up and he balls out. This guy's playing lacrosse, so this guy comes in and balls out. That that's a great place to be. And and that's what Notre Dame has shown themselves to be at this spring. Your starting quarterback can can be out most of the spring. And so what do you do? You have other guys step in and get take their chance. Heck, there was a day that we saw where Steve and Riley were both out, and it was just Kenny and CJ. And you're like, well, this isn't number well, numbers wise where you want to be, but dude, you're down to your third and fourth quarterback, and those dudes are flat out spinning it. And that's a that's a I, I, I'm, that's a fun place to be, and it's good that Notre Dame is there. Now on the flip side cornerback is a little bit more troubling for me. This is a position where we've seen this the depth get tested and it has been found wanting from a couple different aspects. Number 1 is it's a it's really been recruited as a two position place so far. Meaning like Notre Dame has basically recruited the the safety or the receiver position like a three position uh, depth. And what that means is depending on how many players you're going to play regularly your is is going to determine how many players you recruit so if you're a three a position group then you're going to recruit higher numbers we've talked about this a linebacker they don't have to use linebacker they don't have to recruit as many linebackers now because they as they used to where you needed at least nine usually 10 11 because it's a three linebacker defense now it's a two linebacker defense that will will basically have a, a split on that third spot between a linebacker and a defensive back. So you don't need 11, 10, 11, 12 linebackers. You need you can get away with eight. You can have nine be your max. And, and same thing with other positions. Well, cornerback is a position that is starting to become more of a three-position alignment, but you don't have three-guy, three-position depth yet. And that's for a, d a bunch of reasons. Now, obviously, you have some departures this offseason. Cam Hart... He's gone. You have Ryan Barnes. 
He left. He's in the portal. You had Clarence Lewis left during the spring. He's in the portal. And now you also have Benjamin Morrison, who's out. And so now you've lost four corners, and you have two kids that you recruited to play corner that aren't in school yet in Carson Hobbs and Leonard Moore. They're not enrolled yet. They won't be here till the summer. So very, very quickly, the cornerback depth is a problem. And now you've got Christian Gray, Jaden Mickey, and Chance Tucker, and that's it because you've got Micah Bell working the slot. You could move Micah Bell outside, but I, I I think that would be unwise because for me, I think Micah Bell needs all the reps he can get inside at slot, especially from a physicality standpoint. So that's a that's one where it's a little bit problematic. And now you understand why Notre Dame is looking for such a big corner class in 25. Now you know why they're willing to go to four corners because, number one, you've got to restock the two outside positions. But you also – need to start stocking that slot position more with corners. Because they, my understanding and my belief is that Notre Dame would like to start having more corner types in the slot as opposed to safety types. Because they want guys that can cover at a higher level. And the Ohio State game showed that. As good as Thomas Harper was last year, he was still a safety playing nickel. And, and Notre Dame needs more of a, a cover player at that spot. And so – you're, you're seeing how, okay, now the numbers are here. You've got to really step up. And with Benjamin Morrison being what he is, if he's healthy in the fall, you're probably going to lose him too. And now you're looking at a situation where you're going into 2025 with Christian Gray, Jaden Mickey, Micah Bell for three spots. And, and after that, it's guys that aren't on campus right now. Maybe they could bring Chance Tucker back for a fifth year. I would be opposed to that if you can make room for it. Let that kid get a master's degree, and hopefully – and that only happens – the only reason you'd bring Chance back for a fifth year is he goes out this fall, takes advantage of Cam being gone and Clarence being gone and other guys being down, and he steps up and plays well this spring. I hope that happens because then you can more easily justify bringing him back in 2025 where he's going to play more because he showed himself out. If he doesn't, then you won't bring him back. So then you're stuck in a situation where it's – three of those three guys. And then after that, it's a depth chart full of guys that aren't on campus right now. You'll have uh, Carson Hobbs and Leonard Moore who will have gone through a season, but next year when we're talking about this cornerback position, there's a chance that you're going into to, to those situations because, um, you know, because of uh, you just, you're playing freshman because they, you don't have anybody else or sophomores. You don't have anybody else. Cause if one guy goes down Think about this. If if Chance Tucker doesn't have a breakout this year to the point where you convinced to bring him back, you're going to go into 2025 with Christian Gray in the boundary, Jaden Mickey in the field, Micah Bell in the slot. And then after that, it's either two rising sophomores who are going into their first spring or freshmen. That's where the cornerback position is right now because of some things that have kind of you know happened in the partly in the past and and just because certain guys have panned out maybe a little bit better than you thought and there's been some injuries and things like that and because they're expanding to a three corner back room more than they were in the past so in the past they were recruiting for a two cornerback room because if if you're only a two cornerback situation then you've got Jaden and Christian and then Micah Bell as an outside guy so you have three guys and then the two freshmen and then the incoming guys right well now that you're you're expanding to a three cornerback room with Mike Mickens taking over that spreads it out a little bit and that's why you're seeing this problem. So that's also why you're seeing the Notre Dame staff focus the way they are in 2025. So the depth is being tested at cornerback, and it's showing itself to be a little bit precarious to the point where I would actually contend if Chance Tucker doesn't have a breakout spring and prove himself as a guy that you can go win with if his number's called, you may have to consider going to the portal this spring for depth. Not for a starter, not for someone to beat out Benjamin Morrison or somebody to beat out Christian Gray necessarily, but just this guy's a quality football player, and if we need him, we can throw him out there and win because if Chance doesn't step up, now you're in a situation where you may be having to go to a true freshman that that is is going to have to help you. Now, maybe Leonard Moore can be that guy. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. I, I think he's very talented, but is he ready to play in, in year one? I don't know. So that's a position to me that that there's an evolution happening there and it's testing the early depth. And we'll we'll find out here very soon if they're able to handle it at at the cornerback position. So I I would say defensively at certain spots, the safety corner to a degree linebacker uh, until 
some the freshmen fully get here, you're not as deep as theirs you are at other spots at, on offense. And that's that's an interesting dynamic because the talent's very good, but the depth is a little bit shakier now that you've had some departures of some veterans. And you're seeing some of those final seasons of Brian Kelly recruiting woes kind of biting you in the butt because now you're having to play so many young guys. Now, fortunately, those young guys are very talented, but you're having to play those guys, and it puts them in a little bit of a different situation. So that's part two of today's show, and that is the depth at Notre Dame that's being tested. And, and again, the, the final takeaway is that it's being tested. I am, you know, from what I've seen, most of it is just typical spring practice, kind of bumps and bruises, nothing major. So that's encouraging. It's not like, uh oh, this is an epidemic of these major injuries, and you have to question the strength and conditioning program. You always see this kind of stuff. And, and, and a chunk of these guys came – I mean, the tight end depth issues started that way before Lan Lauren Landau was hired. I mean, Mitchell Evans and Kevin Bauman got hurt before he got here. And, and so, you know, some of these other guys have had injury history before the new strength coach got here. Now, it's easy to blame the new strength coach, and I know some have. It's way too early for that. And I think most of the stuff that I've seen, from what I can tell, is either pre-existing injuries. Riley Leonard's a pre-existing injury. Mitchell Evans, Kevin Bauman, Jaden Thomas, to a degree, is a guy that's had this kind of a track record. You know, Benjamin Morrison's the only one that's kind of like, oh, that's a surprise. You know, that we haven't seen that before. The rest are things that don't really have a lot to do with the, the current strength coach. But it, it does kind of show, like, man, you know, this is part of it. This is part of football. Offensively, to see guys step into the spotlight the way that they have and, and look the way that they have is a very, very positive thing. And so I'm encouraged by that. Very, a quarterback, a running back, a receiver, you're in a position now where you can lose one, two guys, not a quarterback, but one or two guys at different positions. And you're like, dude, we're still pretty good there if you're looking at it from a Notre Dame standpoint. And that's a great, great place to be. So before we get into part three, which is Playmakers Emerging, I want you all to do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review. And as always, if you've not done so, you are missing out. I promise you, you're missing out. You, if you if you're just like, hey, I'm just here for the free content only. That's fine. It is what it is. But I'm telling you, you're missing out on some great stuff by not being on the message board at boards.irishbreakdown.com. Part three, the final portion of today's show, going to focus a little bit more on the offense, but not just the offense. But we're talking about playmakers, and we're talking about playmakers emerging that we didn't already know about. So we don't need to talk about, is Benjamin Morrison a playmaker on defense? Is Xavier Watts a playmaker on defense? Is Howard Cross a playmaker on defense? Is, is Riley Mills a playmaker on defense? We already know those things. We know that those guys are studs. I mean, of that group of four guys I just mentioned, three of them have, been, have earned All-American honors at, at Notre Dame. So you're, you're good there. The question is, are you are you having guys emerge that you otherwise didn't know that they were playmakers at this level or guys that have been good players but not big time players or guys that have been playmakers and I'm thinking of Chris Mitchell here but haven't shown it at this level with any consistency now when it comes to I'll talk about Chris Mitchell in a minute but I'm going to focus on guys that right now are showing it this spring and Notre Dame is in a unique position on offense because you go into the spring and you, you have a playmaker quarterback on your roster, a proven playmaker quarterback, one of the best dual threat quarterbacks in college football coming back next year. But he's banged up and he's he's been dealing with some ankle issues. You look at running back, you think you've got some playmakers, and they're talented and they were top recruits, but you know what have they really shown with any consistency in college? Same thing at the receiving core. You've got some young sophomores that – did some had some good moments last year, but you know, really, where are they? And can they be at this level? You had a, one of the better playmakers of tight end last year, but he's out. He's out this spring, and he's been a guy that struggled to stay healthy. So, in my opinion, there was a lot of there's a lot of optimism about oh, this guy can be a playmaker. That guy, but it was all projection. It was all I think Jeremiah Love can be a playmaker. I think Jadarian Price, Jadarian Price can be one. I think this guy can be that. I think that guy can be that. But I don't really know. I'm just going off of what they did in high school or you know, special teams, whatever. And so there was a lot of questions about who those guys were and then how that, how those questions gets answered is going to shape the offense, in my opinion. Well, so I wanted to ask Coach Denbrock about this because it's really fascinating studying the Mike Denbrock offense because it changes so much structurally 
even though he doesn't, he hasn't really changed much at all philosophically. How he, what he believes in, whether not just scheme wise, but more so ways to attack the defense, you know, getting the ball in the hands of your playmakers, having kids that are technically sound and having kids that understand, you know, putting kids in position to be successful and all that kind of stuff, you know, attacking downfield, attacking with the run game. Those are all things, you know, you having a dual threat quarterback. Those are all things that Mike Denbrock's done his whole career. But how he's gotten into those things has changed. He, his offense at Cincinnati looked different than the offense in Notre Dame. The offense at Notre Dame looked different than the offense at LSU. The offense of L- at LSU looked different than the offense at Cincinnati. And I would argue that his offense at LSU in 2022 looked different from his LSU offense in 2023. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. His top, rece- top receiver in 21, 22 and 23 was the same guy. It was Malik Neighbors. Uh, but when you look at the 2022 top, his second guy was, was Boutte, who's a smaller guy, not a burner, more of a quick, shifty guy. He had some issues. And then you look in 2023, and it's Brian Thomas, who's 6'3 plus and fast and diff- different, completely different type of athlete. So the makeup of the receiving core changed. You had a lot more 12 personnel in 2022. Hardly any. I mean, they were in the nine games. I'll give you all a little bit of a tidbit about something that I broke down on the message board. That's a part of the 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 detailed film breakdowns and study st- statistical breakdowns that I'm that are only going to premium members on the board. But I'll give you a little hit tidbit. In the I broke down nine games from 2023. So it was the nine games against Power Five teams for Mike Denbrock. So I didn't br- I didn't break down. At least I didn't like I watched the games, but I didn't break down like include them in the data against Army, Georgia State, or Grambling. Because I don't care that you do things against them. If you're if you're doing things against Grambling or Georgia State, but you don't do them against Bama, then it doesn't mean anything to me. Because I know that Notre Dame can go beat Navy and these teams without that stuff. But can you beat Georgia? Can you beat Bama? So I study the Power 5 games. And they were in 11 personnel. That's one back, one tight end, three receivers, 94% of their snaps last year in those games. In those nine games... They were in 12 personnel 12 times all year. Only 12 times in those nine Power 5 games did did LSU line up with two tight ends. That's it. Then you look at Notre Dame and you're like, dude, they'll do that in a quarter. They'll get – if you – okay, how many snaps did you have in the first quarter? 15? Pretty good chance that you were, you know, surpassed that 12 snaps of 12 personnel, right? And and you also had me had some 13 personnel mixed in there. And then you're like, well, that doesn't really fit what Notre Dame is. Okay, well, let's go back a couple years and let's study Mike Denbrock's offense at Cincinnati. And it, it, I, I remember breaking down the Notre Dame game, and I and I literally went through it just to track this one number. I, I, I remember Mike Denbrock using two tight ends a lot. He had Josh Wiley and Leonard Taylor. I remember, so I went and broke down the Notre Dame game. Twelve snaps of twelve personnel in nine Power Five games at LSU in 2019 or 2023. Against Notre Dame in 2021, his LSU offense, her Cincinnati offense, had 19 snaps of 12 personnel, 19 in one game. And his two tight ends combined for over 50 catches and those type of things. And so what you'll see is Mike Denbrock is going to change what he does run game-wise, not change. He's going to adapt what he does personnel-wise and run game-wise and some of the specifics of what he's going to major in based on his personnel. So my question to him was, all right, well, how does that evolve? How does it evolve? Like, how do you, how, what's the process of getting to learn who that's going to be? So I I asked him on Saturday, I said, is it, is it a combination of like, um, you know, you you have an idea coming in, what's the process? And so we talked about, I was like, this is it. This is the spring is it. And, And the point that he then went on to make is you start to learn now who the playmakers are. And he talked about, you know, I'd seen film of Bo Collins. I mean, they they probably recruited Bo Collins and had obviously when he was at LSU. I'm sure there's times where they'd seen Clemson play. And he studied film of of Chris Mitchell, and you could see film of Jaden Harrison, and there's film of certain guys. But it's one thing to see that film. It's another thing to know that this guy can go be a playmaker in my offense. And so what you do is you get out in the spring, you test guys, you challenge guys, you put guys in situations, and you say, okay, what can we learn? about this group who's going to step up who when i get in their face or when i challenge them or i ask them hey i need you to do this or i need you to do that i'm going to put you in this situation you're going to go against benjamin morrison all day today before he was hurt i'm like, you're going to go at christian gray all day today i'm going to have you lined up where i know xavier watts is going to guard you every single play today and i want to see how you're going to respond sometimes you tell them sometimes you don't 
but you're testing him. You're putting him in situations where I need to know if this guy can make plays. And, you know, whether it's running backs, receivers, all those type of things. And then who whoever steps up, that then is going to determine what my personnel packages are going to be about. You know, the 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 what the strengths of my offensive line are going to help go a long way towards determining what my run game is going to look like. The strengths of my running backs is going to have an impact on what my running game is going to look like. The strength of my tight ends is going to determine how much 11 personnel are we going to use, how much 12 personnel are we going to use. When I'm running inside zone, which is our bread and butter play, I'm just again looking at it from Mike Denbrock's standpoint. Do I have tight ends that can kind of come out and, and bully people? Do I need to be more moving the tight ends around? Because it's you know Mason Taylor is a very talented pass catcher. He gives effort in the run game, but he was a true sophomore last year. So you had to do different things to help him with leverage and angles and getting running head starts and things like that so he could be more effective in the run game instead of just lining him up and say drive block a nine technique like you could do maybe with, with Cooper Flanagan or Eli Raritan when they were freshmen who were much bigger and stronger players. And how that is going to go is going to determine how what, what kind of form your offense is going to take. Well, one of the biggest things is, and this is true of Mike Denbrock's offense for sure, and this is true of really any offense that's any good, is you have to, you can scheme all you want, you can game plan all you want, you can use motions and shifts and every trick in the book. You can use all of your bags of tricks, everything you got, and and it's going to work for you to a degree. But if you want to truly be a team that's competing for championships, that only gets you so far. Kansas last year, to me, is a great example. I think Kansas's offensive coordinator is one of the more creative coaches in all of college football. I mean, he is a super, super creative guy, and he kind of has to be. He has to be a guy that goes out there and does all those kind of things because he doesn't have the kind of talent that other teams have. But when you're playing Texas and their dudes are way better than your dudes, it doesn't matter. When you're when you're playing other teams and you're just like, dude, our dudes are our dudes are not as good as their dudes. That'll get you to nine and four, but it doesn't get you to 12 and 0. It doesn't get you 11 and one. It doesn't get you to make runs in the playoff. That's just a fact. You need all those things. You need a smart coach, a guy that understands technique and a guy that understands matchups and a guy that understands how to use his personnel to the best of their ability. But the talent of that personnel is going to determine just how much you can do. And I love the comment from Michael Parks. He's like, Boise State that stuff up. But again, what happened when Boise went to play Georgia a couple times? What happened when you know they started playing teams that had had defenses that had better players than them? You can get away with it in a bowl game. It's a lot harder to do that in the regular season, and it's a lot harder to do that with any consistency. And and so you need playmakers. And that was the biggest question that I had: is I know that Notre Dame has guys that are capable of being playmakers, but do they actually have playmakers? And so what I want to talk about today is some guys that we have seen step up this spring from what we have seen and from what I have heard about who have stepped up this spring. And the biggest revelation is going to be the least surprising re revelation to all of you. And that is, is that Notre Dame is going to use their two running backs a lot. Now, I'm not saying they're going to use them together a lot. That remains to be seen. But from what I have heard and what we have seen, Notre Dame has about as explosive of, of a one-two punch at running back as you're going to see. Certainly a more explosive running back combination than we've seen in a long time in Notre Dame. And that's saying something when you consider not that long ago, we saw lineups with Dexter Williams and Josh Adams. And we saw lineups with Josh Adams and C.J. Procise and guys like that. You're seeing some flat-out juice at running back. And the reality that Notre Dame has found this spring is that Jeremiah Love can impact the game in a lot of different ways. A lot of the things they were doing in early in spring of moving him around was to, again, it was part of that testing process. What can he do? Can he line up outside? Can he catch the ball down the field? Can he can he run routes? Can he can he catch back shoulders? You know, can can we run him on the wide fade stuff? Can we just run him on screens? Can he run overs? Can he run seams? Can he catch a seam? Those are all things you needed to learn about him. And he's, for the most part, from what I could tell, has answered the bell. And Jadarian Price, but that only works if Jadarian Price is a dude at running back, in my opinion. Because you can't take Jeremiah. If Jeremiah Love is by far your number one running pure running back, then you're going to have you're going to be in a situation where, okay, that's great. But when he's lined up outside, where's your running threat? Well, it's Riley Leonard. But what if Riley's not your quarterback? You're going to do that with Steve, Steve Angeli? You're going to do that with C.J. Carr or Kenny Minchie? No, you're not. 
And and so you needed that second back to step up. And Jadarian showing that he's not a great number two back. Jadarian is showing that I'm a legit number one back. And that was the key because the message that the coaching staff gave to Jadarian and Jeremiah coming into the spring was, we want you guys to be 1A, 1B. And that sounds wonderful. It sounds great. But you can say that as your pitch to keep them in on, on your on happy and to keep them on your roster. But if they don't play that way, you can't continue to live that way. I can't continue to live as something I claim to be if I'm not that thing. So you can tell Jeremiah all you want, you're a 1A or a 1B, or you can tell Jadarin all you want, you're 1A, 1B. But if they don't go out and play like 1A or 1B, you can't keep them as 1A, 1B. And the great thing that I've heard and what we've seen is Jeremiah and Jadarin are both playing like ones. Like, I'm that dude. And they have what I can tell is a very friendly and but a very fierce. It's like two great talents. Like, oh, yeah, you want to go rip off that 50-yard run? Bet. Look what I got. Oh, you want to go make that catch out there, Jeremiah? Watch me house this inside zone. Oh, Jadarn, you want to take this inside zone for the house? Watch me do this on my inside zone carry. And what you're seeing is that the two of them are very, very good talents, very good talents, but their presence pushes each other every day. And, and you know, if you're Jeremiah Love, you can't have any days off because Jadarian's going to go out there and ball. If you're if you're Jadarian, you can't go out there and take days off because Jeremiah is going to ball or, or Kedron's going to ball or Aeneas is going to ball or Jabron's going to ball. And it's really razor level of play. So from what I have seen and from what I've heard, the playmaking at running back this spring and all facets of the game is very, very exciting. And that's a huge step. But also one that I don't think any of you are going to be overly surprised by. It's good confirmation, but it's not something that I find at all surprising. The bigger question is, is who steps up outside? Because, hey, guess what? Notre Dame had one of the best running backs in college football last year, too. And their offense still sputtered into big games, partly because of how they used him or didn't use him in certain situations. But the other part was because, like in the Clemson game, in the Louisville game, the other team said, I'm going to beat your butts up front. We're not going to let Audrey Estime beat you. If you're going to beat us, you have to beat us outside. And guess what? Notre Dame couldn't beat those teams outside. Couldn't. And that's that's the bigger question mark for me. And so when you look at this Notre Dame football team, you say, okay, who are the pass catchers? Okay, we know Mitchell Evans can be, but can Mitchell Evans play 12 games? The next time Mitchell Evans plays 12 games in a regular season will be the first time Mitchell Evans plays 12 games in a regular season. Now, it'd be great if he does, but you can't count on that. But also, you need to be smart. Why would I want to rush him to play 12 games, knowing that if we want to win a championship, he's got to play four more. But you can't you can't take the burden off of his shoulders, off of his legs, if you don't have the talent to step up. You can say all you want, hey, we need playmakers at receiver and put guys in position, but somebody's got to step up. And, and it can't be just Mitchell Evans. Even if Mitchell comes back and he's healthy for 16 games and he's the best tight end in college football, that's only going to get you so far. What's the supporting cast look like? That's the biggest question. And that, to me, is the, the most encouraging thing that I've seen from spring so far. Now, we haven't seen a lot of Chris Mitchell this spring. Not that he hasn't done anything effectively or he hasn't played well. It's just we literally have not seen him take a lot of reps. Now, from what I've heard when he's been out there, I've heard good things. But we just haven't seen it. But we have seen film of him. I, I, I Again, I go back and reference the Arkansas game. So, to me, Chris Mitchell is still a little bit of a – an, an unknown to me. I've heard some good things, but I haven't seen as much of it in person. I'm still relying off what he showed me on film. And what he showed me on film was very, very impressive. <clears throat> so to me, I still have a little bit of a, I don't want to keep saying to me a lot today. I apologize. When I look at Chris Mitchell, I see potential to be a difference maker, but I still need to see it in the Notre Dame uniform. It's not that he hasn't looked good. It's just legitimately, folks, I'm telling you, I just haven't seen him take a lot of reps. That's where I'm at. Can Bo Collins be that guy? I think Bo's got the chance to be that. But again, I haven't seen him do it in Notre Dame uniform. At some point in time, I need to see guys do it in a Notre Dame uniform before I can start to say they got playmakers. And there's two guys that I talked a little bit about earlier that a receiver that stepped up and then a guy at tight end that's really stepped up that I want to talk about. That has me encouraged about what we're going to see from Notre Dame this, this season at receiver. First of all, I talked earlier about Jaden Greathouse. What we have seen from Jaden Greathouse is exactly what I hoped he would be 
if he reaches his peak. So I had Jaden Greathouse as a top 100 player. He was so savvy and nuanced. Gave him four and a half star upside. But the four and a half star upside was about, can he get more explosive athletically? That Jaden Greathouse had five-star production in high school. He had five-star highlight film, like big time. I mean, just how you watch his film and didn't be like, dude, that's a five-star high school football player is you just, you had to. The question that I had and some other people had was, what is the projection like? And for me, I projected him better than most. I'm going to look up his uh, his high school ranking, but I don't think when it was all said and done, anyone had him in the top 100 outside of the SI All-American, which is no longer a thing. But let me just look at this real quick. So, yes, Rivals was the highest at 107. ESPN had him at 122, on three at 164. And 247 did not think Jaden Greathouse was one of the 247 best high school football players in the country coming out. I think those were all wrong. Rivals was closest. Adam's the top 100 guy. I think he was a top 75 ish kind of guy for me, top 90, because he was just so savvy and he knew how to play. The four and a half star stuff, the potential five star stuff. Actually, you know what? I actually think I gave Jaden Greathouse a five star upside. Uh, let me let me just look this up because I think I just quoted my own grades wrong. So, yes, I gave him a five-star upside for college. So the thing for me was he's a four-star talent now. Five-star production, five-star impact in high school, but there were questions about could that translate to college in a five-star level, and a lot of it had to do with he had to get stronger, like all high school kids do. But could he show another gear? Because there were plays he made in high school that you'd say, that was a heck of a play. Can he do that against Christian Gray? Can he do that against Benjamin Morrison? Can he do that against Xavier Watts? Because if he can do it against those guys, he can do it against anybody, right? And those are the questions about could that translate to that, to the next level? We saw last year, Jaden has all the confidence that you want in a five-star. He's got all the, you know, uh, feel for the game and all those things that you want but was he strong enough and was he going to be athletic enough to really separate the biggest thing that i've seen this spring from Jaden greathouse is not he's a great route runner because we knew that it's not that he has really good ball skills because we already knew that it's not that he's confident because we already knew that we knew all those things the biggest encouragement to me that i've seen this spring is he's gotten stronger which you expected i mean kids are going to come to college and as long as they work get stronger He's filling out nicely, but not every kid takes a jump athletically in co- in high school or in college. Some do. Some take some level. Some take big jumps. Will Fuller took a big jump. Some guys are just, you know, I'm a 4'6", and by the time I'm done in college, I'm a 4'5". Five, five. But with Jaden, we have seen a completely different level of explosiveness this spring. Now, part of it was because he was banged up a lot last year. But also part of it is he needed to reshape his body. He needed to kind of grow up and physically mature. And those things are happening. And we're seeing a a much better off-the-line burst. We're seeing much better explosiveness out of his top ends. We're seeing Jaden show more of the ability to accelerate as he gets into an over route, for example, where he can kind of get going and then accelerate to the football in ways that he didn't last year. You know, he said, hey, I had 11 catches in the spring game last year. Yeah, they were like all caught within five to 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. They were all stop routes. They were options and, you know, uh, hitches and things like that. They weren't him outrunning people. He's showing more of an ability to, to, to show that level of speed this spring. And when you combine that with the other things, you start to understand why he has been without question the most impressive receiver this entire spring. I have not been to one practice, the, the first practice. Now, when I talked about Chris Mitchell, the encouraging thing I have about him is – we did see him at one practice be let go, and it was the first one, and he made a bunch of big plays down the field. Uh, but they didn't have pads on. So it was like, well, you know, what can you really tell about that? But that's the stuff we saw on film. Since that – I mean, but even that day, I, 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 I'm i going to have to go back and look, but I, I, it wouldn't be shocked if I also told you guys then that Jade Greathouse is the most impressive guy. And he just has been all spring. But he's not alone, and that's the thing that I'm encouraged by. You know, there's been some good play – I've liked what I've seen from Dion. He's still emerging. He's still got a lot to prove. KK Smith has shown me some things. You know, Cam Williams shows me really good at vertical speed. Jade Harrison has shown me some stuff with the ball in his hands. 
But the guy to me that in the last three or four sessions that we've seen, that's made the biggest leap and has really shown the most playmaking ability is Micah Gilbert. Now, I know you guys all saw the highlight film that Notre Dame put up on the tweet and with him making back shoulder plays and all that kind of stuff, and, and that's fine. I haven't seen any. I didn't see that. We weren't there that day. I'm just telling you guys what I've seen when I watch practice and the things that I've seen and then what I've heard from, from, from people is that Micah Gilbert is that dude. And, I, I mean, I asked somebody yesterday – who's close to the program. I was like, you know, what, you know, what are you hearing about receiver? And the first thing that was brought up was Micah Gilbert's going to be a problem for people. And, and he's going to be a problem for receive for DBs this year, this year, not, not next year when his time comes this year, that dude's going to be a problem for people. And, and when you're hearing that from how well the, the rest of the group is playing, you, you know, that you've got something on your hands. And this is one of those evaluations that you start to say, boy, they made a really good evaluation with this one because this is a kid that is, is showing that he has the size, he has the athleticism, he has the playmaking ability and all those type of things to really be an impact player. And that's something that kind of gets you really fired up about it. And um, to have a guy step up and – like kind of shine in this room with the players they have says a lot, but also it answers a, it answers a big question, which is what's the future of the boundary position? Because like, look, if everybody's healthy boundary in 2024 should be pretty good and loaded. You've got Jaden Thomas, you've got Bo Collins, you've got Deion Colsey and you're like, yeah, for this year, you should be pretty good. But what about the next year? Well, here's the thing. Mike is playing as well as any of those guys have. Now, obviously Bo is, not there. So Bo does, you know, Bo, I don't count Bo in that conversation, but now you say, well, you know what? The future of that position looks kind of okay now because you've got Micah, but his ability to make plays when the ball's in the air is not overly surprising. So like the highlight tapes, like, yeah, okay. Micah Goldberg knows how to catch the ball. We knew that again. I don't get fired up when we see things we already knew. Like, yeah, I, I expected that. It's when you see things, maybe you weren't expecting. And that's been the thing for me is just the the athletic talent that Micah brings to the table is even better than I thought it was going to be already. Whereas like Jaden kind of needed a year to get there to reshape his body. Micah came in kind of a pretty well-developed kid. He's got good DNA and he was pushed in, in high school. You could tell to really build his body up the right way. And you're seeing him show that burst, show that speed, show that ability to go make plays that we hadn't seen in the past. And that's got me really fired up about what he can be. So that's, Two kids that I have seen on multiple days and I've heard from multiple sources are, have stepped up as legit playmakers this spring. And at two different positions, that's the big key. It's like last year, all the guys that kind of were playmakers were all slots. You know, this year it's 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 at different positions. And then, of course, we did see Chris Mitchell that one practice. And, and of course, we know, we know he did at Florida International. There's one other guy that's having a really good spring that we're not talking a lot about. And that's Cooper Flanagan. We know he can block. We know he can work the quick routes because he's a big kid. I have been really surprised at how well Cooper Flanagan runs. Like that is a kid that I thought I liked him coming out. He had him as a four-star kid. I believe I had him as a top 200-ish, 250 caliber caliber player. But he came from a system where he was just, you know, blocking and moving the chains. So how good could he really be? And, you know, Ryan has talked about, and I've talked about a lot where – um you know, you, you look at a kid like him and you're like, well, hey, you know, this this kid might even be able to go play defensive line for you, you know, at some point in time. And, um, you know, that's kind of that's kind of what you, you like to see from from, you know, certain kids. You need that role. That's all. It's all good. It's all it's it's wonderful. But to really be that impact player, you got to be able to make plays in the pass game. You can't just be a blocker. And you know that he's got good hands. That was true in high school. You know, he's long. We always knew that. I've really been surprised how well he runs. And today it was a perfect example. I've liked what I've seen from him so far, but today he had a play where I I believe it was Angeli, but I could be wrong. It might have been CJ threw a corner route, and when and, and so I'm I'm they're the quarterbacks to my right, and Cooper Flanagan's running a route to the left, meaning like I've got the quarterback and the receiver in my, the tight end in my line of sight, and I can see the ball come out of the quarterback's hands, and I can see where it's going. And I can see where the tight end is. And my first thought was, too long. He threw it too far. And then all of a sudden, Cooper Flanagan kind of turns on the Jets a little bit and accelerates and catches the ball 
here. Not even like, okay, it turned on the Jets and extend. He caught it like here, caught it, accelerated upfield. He's done that a few times on routes like that. He's done it on over the middle routes where you're like, this kid runs a whole lot better than I thought. And this kid plays with a confidence that that I didn't really expect to see from the in the past game from him. And so you are in a situation now where if Mitchell Evans comes back, you're in a really dynamic position because you have Eli Raritan and you have Mitchell Evans and Cooper Flanagan. But if Mitchell Evans doesn't come back or if Eli Raritan doesn't come back, you're still in a – as long as one of those two is back, you're still in a situation where you've got two legit playmaker talents at tight end. And so now you start to say, okay, the tight end room doesn't have as many numbers as it had in the past, but there's a lot of talent there. And so I'm encouraged to see that from the tight end position. We'll talk about a couple guys on defense. Number three guys, really. One, real short and sweet. Christian Gray, so far, from what I've seen and from what I've heard, is everything that we thought he would be. Just, yep, he's that next in line star corner. And he has really stepped up to the plate with Benjamin Morrison being out, playing boundary and doing some things. So, yep, you know, you, you know that from – we kind of knew that. Talked to a couple sources. Because I, you know, defensively, we haven't seen a lot of practice. That's why I'm doing defense last, and it's going to be a little bit quicker. We haven't seen a lot of practice from them. It's been a lot of drills. So I can tell you, hey, guys, look, Drake Bowen looks great in drills. He's a four-star recruit who's 6'2 plus, who's 235, 240 pounds, and he's a great athlete. Guess what? Yeah, he looks good in drills. Wonderful. You know, I guess it's good confirmation, but whatever. Jaden Osbury looks really good in drills. He looks really athletic in drills. Okay, whatever. Wonderful. I expected that. What I've heard, however, is that those two guys, and especially Drake and Mike, have really stepped up this spring. Now, there's still a lot to learn with those two kids, but the playmaking has been really, really good. The speed has been really, really good to where the, the, I believe we're going to see them play at least four or five linebackers in games this year. But I think Drake is going to be a guy that is – going to be very hard to supplant from the Mike position as long as he stays healthy from what I've heard and what I've seen. And Jaden Osbury is a guy that is going to be very hard not to play. Now, obviously you got Jack Kaiser. I've heard has had a very good spring. Jalen Sneed is the light starting to go on a little bit for him, which is very, very encouraging. But Jaden Osbury is another guy that's just like really stepped up as a playmaker this spring. And I think his emergence is going to have a huge impact to me on Jalen Sneed. Because if Jaden Osbury keeps doing what he's doing, I think it forces Jalen's need to really lock in and raise his level of play. And I've heard a lot of good things about Kingston and Preston Zinner, and they love the linebacker room talent-wise, but those two kids are the ones that no matter who I talk to, 34 and 4 keep getting mentioned to me as guys that are really stepping up as playmakers. And so that's a great sign. And then another guy that we have seen with our eyes, but also I've heard a lot about, is Adon Schuler. I think Adon's play this spring, from what I've been told, has and and what we've seen in practice, has has sort of um, created a little bit more. Okay, we can breathe a little bit at safety because obviously Xavier Watts is there. The staff really likes Rod Hurd and what he's about. So you have two veterans there that you kind of know about, but at least one of these young guys are going to have to play. Who's it going to be? We don't really know, and so. When you when you look at what we have seen from Adon this spring and what I've heard about Adon this spring is the light has gone on for Adon. He's playing fast. He's making a ton of plays in the run game, and he's making plays in the pass game as well. There's still technical things he has to learn. There's still, you know, he'll he'll get himself out of position with from an assignment standpoint, which you expect. He's got to learn all that. But Adon has really stepped up as a potential playmaker at safety this year, where there's a little bit of a okay, we're going to be all right at safety with these three kids. Now we just got to work on Luke Talich. And I heard some things about what they're doing with him to try to really ramp him up and get him going. You got Ben Minnick. You've got um, uh, Devin Ford that's learning the position. Of course, we'll get Bronte Johnson, who we saw after practice on Saturday. He was at practice on Saturday just watching. He's not enrolled yet. Uh, love how long and athletic he looked. Tabor on Benny Powell has been at some practices. And, of course, Kennedy Erlacher's on the roster now as well. So, a Don stepping up allows them to kind of really then focus on pushing Luke and Ben, but it gives them a sense of, okay, we're going to be okay here as long as we can stay healthy. So having a Don and Drake and Jaden 
really be breakouts as potential playmakers this spring has been something that I've I've heard quite a bit about and feel like this puts them in position to to solidify the second and third levels of the defense. Now, breaking down the spring is one thing. You got to do it in the fall. But if you don't break out in the spring, it makes it a lot harder to do that in the fall. There's things you have to overcome. It also makes it harder for coaches. Like if a guy doesn't break out till middle of fall, well, you've spent all off season thinking you're going to be one thing and this guy steps up and it's a pleasant surprise. You love it. You're happy about it, but you'd much rather those things happen in the spring because that gives you time to really go into the offseason. season. Okay. I know I got playmakers here. I know I got playmakers there. So at the very least we go into fall camp knowing we can be, we can have, we can buy ballers here. Now we can hope that this guy also steps up and that guy also steps up. So that's kind of where Notre Dame is right now when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. It's encouraging to see this. Also knowing who they're going against every day in practice and knowing in order to stand out, you've got to go against this guy and that guy is also very encouraging. So it's it's still a work in progress at receiver. There's still a lot of things they got to learn, but we're seeing as a group them coming along, but more so you're starting to see those two guys I talked about, Jaden Greatass and Micah Gilbert, really stepping up. Uh, as potential playmakers for Notre Dame. So I'm very, very happy about that. That's going to do it for today's show, everybody. I want to thank you all for being with me. Six o'clock tonight, IB Nation Sports Talk. The guys will be live tonight. I'll be back tomorrow with another show tomorrow. We'll see what we want to talk about. If you guys got some things you'd like for me to talk about, go and throw those on the message board. I'd love to hear your guys' ideas on, on some things you'd like to hear me discuss over these next couple of weeks before we dive into our summer uh, con- post spring summer content so uh we'd like to hear some of your guys ideas but i certainly have some things that i i like to talk about but you know i want to know what the audience thinks so go to the message board at boards.irishbreakdown.com and give me some show ideas some things you guys would like to hear me discuss and uh, we'll have fun with that thursday's show and friday's show guys right now is a little bit up in the air as far as when or or you know, whether i'll be on the show or when simply because this is the last week that they're doing stuff on our house. They're supposed to finalize everything either Thursday or Friday, maybe both days. So I'm not quite sure what the time is going to be and when, but that's why you need to be subscribed and hit the notification bell so that when we do announce a time is going to go live, you'll be able to see that and get that uh, sent to your phone directly or your email directly. So definitely want to check that out. But after this week, we're going to get onto a more normal schedule. We'll get back on track and all those type of things. So I'm excited about that. So we'll be ready to rock and roll. So Anyway, but I want to thank you all who are with me today. Very good crowd today. I want to appreciate you all very much. Uh, lot, getting closer to spring game next it was the next Saturday, right? Uh, there is a chance that Friday night before the game, I may do some sort of like get together at a local restaurant. I'll let you guys know if I plan on you know what exactly we'll do uh, in that regard. It'll be somewhat near campus, so just be on the lookout for that. I'm not sure how many people are interested in that. If you are, again, let me know either on Twitter or on the message board message board especially let me know if you guys are going to be in town friday night and if you'd uh, be interested in doing something so definitely want to do that as well so have a great rest of your day everybody thank you all for joining me hit that like hit that subscribe hit the notification bell if you haven't done so we'd love a five-star review and especially if you haven't done so get on the message board at boards breakdown.com we'll talk to you all again very very soon on the irish breakdown podcast <laughs>